Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning from Geneva. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to this webinar uh, co-hosted by ICROM and ALIF. Um, I'm Maya Kominko. Um, I'm Scientific and Programs Director at ALIF, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, as we want to give people a few minutes to join, we will play a little, a short video of the Sursak Palace, the building which is very much uh, in the center of our conversation today. Uh, so. Okay, so I see we, people are joining. Uh, therefore, just a few items of um, housekeeping. Uh, so uh, the meeting is recorded and it will be posted um, at, uh, through Alif media channels. Uh, there is simultaneous translation. To access it, you have to click a little image of a globe uh, with a caption interpretation. Uh, if you choose no interpretation, you will hear the speakers. To hear the interpretation, please choose either English or French. Uh, we ask speakers to uh, keep to the allotted time. Um, I will limit my presentations to an absolute minimum, both in the interest of time, but also because our speakers today do not need uh, an introduction. Uh, Finally, we have to have as much time, we, we would like to have as much time for the discussion um, as possible. To uh, submit new questions, please use questions and answers uh, tab. Um, and I'm very grateful to my colleagues, Alexandra and Andrea, who will help to ensure that everything goes smoothly. If there are any problems, technical problems, please signal them in the chat. And now, without um, any further delay, I'm going to hand, hand over to Dr. Sarkis Khoury. Thank you so very much, Dr. Khoury, for being with us today. Bonjour. Chers collègues et amis, c'est avec un grand plaisir que je participe à cet événement culturel promettant, particulièrement dans ces circonstances contraignantes qui affligent le Liban. Au-delà de tous ces enjeux, s'adjoint la désastreuse explosion de 4 août 2020 qui a contribué à aggraver la situation en affectant les symboles culturels de Beyrouth et notamment le musée national, le musée et le palais Sursault. Assumant ses responsabilités, le ministère de la Culture, Direction générale des Antiquités, a eu tout de suite l'initiative de créer une cellule de crise formée de professionnels dans le domaine du patrimoine matériel et immatériel, et par conséquent a lancé son grand projet BAC, Beirut Access Cultural Heritage, afin de gérer et assurer l'opération de la sauvegarde et la préservation de l'identité de notre capital. Les dommages ne sont pas limités au patrimoine architectural et au tissu urbain, mais également au tissu social et aux industries culturelles. À partir de là, il est essentiel de prendre en compte l'écosystème socioculturel dans la préservation et la réhabilitation des bâtiments patrimoniaux dans la zone sinistrée. Vu que ce tissu socioculturel est au cœur de la dynamique économique, touristique et sociale, Dans ce sens, le plan quinquennal de promotion culturelle au Liban, lancé en 2017 par le ministère de la Culture, adopte l'initiative de tirer parti des bâtiments historiques symboliques 
et les convertissant en plateformes culturelles et touristiques, musées, galeries d'art permanentes ou temporaires ou autres. Cette initiative engendre une mesure efficace pour inciter les propriétaires à préserver leurs bâtiments anciens. Elle constitue une source d'investissement socio-économique et un pilier indispensable au développement durable. En outre, elle soutient les travailleurs du secteur et les communautés avoisinantes de ces bâtiments, tout en offrant des possibilités d'emploi et augmentant le revenu pour un large éventail de citoyens. Dans ce cadre, les sondages effectués par la DGA et ses associés constatent que plus de 50% de praticiens de la culture envisagent de se délocaliser. Nous observons un flux migratoire considérable dû à un manque de moyens financiers, d'accessibilité aux matériaux et aux équipements techniques, ainsi qu'aux espaces de création. À titre d'exemple, le Palais Sursau, connu sous le nom de Palais Lady Cochrane, est un musée autonome. Cette fascinante demeure beyrouthine avait résisté à l'époque ottomane aux diverses guerres pour être gravement endommagée par la tragique explosion, subissant des lourdes pertes en termes de patrimoine et d'art à la fois. Ainsi, l'initiative très appréciée de la famille Cochrane de transformer partiellement leur palais en un musée et centre culturel se marie parfaitement non seulement avec la reconstruction du patrimoine bâti et dévasté, mais avec la réhabilitation de toute une communauté d'artistes et d'artisans qui faisaient la particularité de cette région représentant l'âme vibrante de Beyrouth. Permettez-moi de dédier un grand hommage à la mémoire de Lady Cochrane, qui a eu la grâce de ne pas souffrir à assister des armées à la destruction de son foyer qui était l'œuvre de toute sa vie. Lady Cochrane, figure emblématique de la défense du patrimoine de Beyrouth, faisait corps avec les quartiers historiques de Beyrouth et avait été à l'origine de la création de l'APSAT en 1960, l'Association pour la protection des sites et anciennes demeures, qu'elle avait présidée jusqu'à 2002. Encore, je profite de cette occasion pour remercier chaleureusement la Fondation Alif pour l'aide d'urgence qu'elle a immédiatement accordée au musée national, aussi bien au musée sur au bâtiment historique. À titre personnel, qu'il me soit également permis de remercier Valérie Furlan, directeur exécutif d'Alif, qui m'a assuré son soutien dès le lendemain de l'explosion. En effet, je dois encore présenter mes remerciements aux organisateurs de cette activité culturelle et à toutes les institutions locales et internationales, aussi bien les initiatives bénévoles provenant de la société civile qui apportent une compte essentiel à la reconstruction, encore aux habitants qui tentent de se reconstruire pour faire renaître une nouvelle fois Beyrouth de ses centres. Je vous remercie. Um, thank you, Dr. Kouli. Uh, we will now move to uh, Valérie Franan, uh, the executive director of Alif. Valérie, over to you. You are muted, Valérie. Sorry, microphone. Uh, je, je poursuivrai en français parce que je crois que le reste de la, la réunion se fera en anglais. Um, et donc, il y, a, il y a une traduction qui vous est proposée. Uh, merci, cher Sarkis, pour ces mots. À mon tour, uh, c'est à moi de vous remercier uh, pour uh, votre présence aujourd'hui et, et pour cette introduction. Cela fait effectivement huit mois que nous travaillons ensemble à la stabilisation et à la réhabilitation du patrimoine de Beyrouth avec l'appui de nombreux opérateurs que je ne peux pas tous citer ici. Et je veux ici vous remercier, remercier votre équipe et remercier chacun de ces opérateurs, libanais ou internationaux, pour la qualité du travail que nous avons fait ensemble, mais aussi pour la relation que nous avons nouée ensemble et je crois une relation de confiance et d'amitié. Je veux également remercier Mary Cochrane de sa présence, la remercier pour aussi la visite qu'elle qu m'a faite il y a déjà six mois de, de ce palais euh, auquel nous sommes naturellement tous très attachés. 
À travers ce panel, nous souhaitons contribuer à la réflexion autour de cette belle idée, ce beau projet qu'a Mary Cochrane, de transformer le Palais sur Soc en maison musée, témoignage d'une histoire, d'une architecture et d'une collection prestigieuse au cœur de Beyrouth. Je remercie également chacun des intervenants pour leur temps et leur engagement. Je rappelle que vos présentations devront tenir en 10 minutes afin que nous puissions avoir une riche discussion tous ensemble ensuite. Un grand merci également à Marie-Hélène Affèche, grande experte de musée, qui assurera les conclusions et à l'ICOM pour être notre partenaire aujourd'hui. Permettez-moi enfin de remercier mon équipe pour la préparation de cette rencontre qui sera animée par Maya Cominco, que vous connaissez désormais, directrice scientifique et des programmes d'ALIF. Avant que Maya ne lance la discussion, permettez-moi de dire que, effectivement, depuis huit mois, Beyrouth a été une priorité pour ALIF. Nous avons jusqu'à présent soutenu plus de près d'une vingtaine de projets pour un montant total de 2,35 millions de dollars d'engagement. Et parmi les grands projets qui se présentent à nous, il y en a deux maintenant que nous devons aborder et qu'il n'est pas facile d'aborder. C'est à la fois la réhabilitation et la transformation du Palais sur Soc en musée, mais aussi la réhabilitation de pâté de maison, de quartier dans la vieille ville de Beyrouth. Ce sont là deux chantiers que nous souhaitons engager, mais qui sont très compliqués sur le plan juridique, notamment à mettre en œuvre. S'agissant du projet de Marie Cochrane, je voudrais euh, appeler votre attention sur trois points. D'abord, comment réhabiliter le palais et sa collection Comment accompagner une initiative privée qui a vocation à créer un lieu ouvert au public Et je crois que là, c'est euh, une, 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 un, un vrai enjeu, une vraie difficulté. Ensuite, quel projet muséal faut-il proposer à Beyrouth et au monde Et quels sont les enjeux qui doivent être surmontés Et enfin, dernière question qui me paraît essentielle, je crois que l'un des principaux enjeux, c'est celui de la pérennité d'une nouvelle initiative muséale au cœur de Beyrouth. Comment faire en sorte qu'un tel projet ambitieux puisse être pérenne Je conclurai en disant que pour Alif, ce projet est important, mais qu'également est importante la réhabilitation de quartiers de la vieille ville dans leur diversité culturelle et sociale. Et c'est un autre chantier qui nous intéresse également et qui est également un défi à relever. Je vous remercie tous et je repasse la parole à Maya pour lancer la discussion. Merci infiniment. Thank you so very much, Valerie, and thank you, Dr. Kore. Uh, before I uh, uh, hand over to Mary, just to remind to everyone that you can access interpretation, trans simultaneous translation, under the little globe at the bottom of your screen. And to hear the interpreters, uh, please select English or French. Um, I am delighted now to hand over to Mary Cochrane, uh, the owner of the Sursuk Palace. Uh, to, to present uh, her vision of the palace and its transformation to the museum. Over to you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to Aleph for organizing this webinar, and especially for the introduction to the panel, who are all generously sharing their expertise on converting and managing uh, our home, which will be a museum and cultural center. Uh, I'd like to start with a brief history of our house. In 1860, Musa Sursak and his wife, Anastasia, built the house for their growing family, which became eight children. Most likely, the house was designed by the Beyland architects, who were the principal architects of the Ottoman sultans in the 18th and 19th century. The plan resembles many of the palaces in Istanbul, also the interiors and details. The interiors of Sursak Palace were originally Napoleon III with a mix of Orientalism and Baroque style. In 1900, Alfred Sursak, one of the five sons, became the owner of the palace and he acquired a collection of 17th century Italian paintings, 16th century Flemish tapestries and European furniture. Alfred married Maria Sara de Cassano, a duchess from Naples. He passed away only a couple of years after they were married, leaving his wife, his daughter Yvonne, my husband's mother, at two years old, and a house of spinster aunts to bring her up. Yvonne, my mother-in-law, married Sir Desmond Cochrane, an Anglo-Irish baronet, and had four children. 
She passed away uh, due to uh, effects of the blast a month after uh, August 4th. Her third son, who's my husband, Roderick, grew up in Lebanon until the beginning of the Civil War in 75 and moved away to London. 24 years ago, Roderick and I met and got married in London, and we moved back to Beirut to live and restore the upstairs of the house to live in. We restored the roofs and all the rooms upstairs. So the decision to convert the house into a museum came naturally because for the last 22 years after restoring the house, the gardens have been open to the public for events. The palace has been open for private tours. And I'm gonna show you some slides of the inside, which will have the interiors before is on the left of the screen and after the blast is on the right. So over 22 years, we've had nearly 900 garden events, including private and corporate dinners and receptions, charity events and films and photo shoots. On a yearly average, 8,000 guests come through the events, come through the garden and attend events. Internally, we have had on average of eight tours of 30 people visit per year. Some of the visitors we've had are architectural digest groups, the Maxi Museum group, various diplomatic groups, architectural and academic groups. We have never refused the tour to anyone interested in art and architecture. And we've made exceptions for people who have even had one or two people wanting to show the house to their visitors or guests, foreign guests that they've had. We've also have an extensive private collection of archives, which spans the dating back to when the house was built in the 1800s. We've had writers, and researchers come and access the archives for uh, their books and research. Post August 4th blast, we have been focusing on safeguarding the house and the collection from further damage. With very little government assistance and the professionals and volunteers stepped up to assist people affected by the blast. The north elevation, which took the brunt of the blast, shown here, is about 500 meters from the epicenter of the blast. Thanks to the engineer Michelle Chalhou and Alif, the propping was completed before the rainy season. A BOQ was done by Davina Albujaudi and her team, which was essential for the damage assessment and to get a timeline for restoration. Aladi and Blue Shield, also with Alif, applied the flex, the white flex on all of the openings. Not one pane of glass was left intact after the blast. This was all done very quickly and efficiently and prior to the rains. The left image shows Baladi on their second mission, which is safeguarding the paintings, prints, and drawings. Nearly 500 prints have been photographed, wrapped and stored. And we have still more to do. The database was set up by Restart Beirut and it will be used for the entire collection inventory. Moving forward, preliminary plan for the museum with the flow has been done voluntarily by local architects, David Shalal and Nicholas, with the help of Chiara Farrelly. The museum visits will be by guided tours and we plan to have temporary exhibitions in the main, in the main hall on the ground floor, which will create interest for local visitors to return multiple times. The garden will continue to have our events, but we'll add cultural events to this art exhibitions, musical evenings, family workshops, and films for the summer will be shown in the summer. <clears throat> Pardon me. Internally, during the winter months, 
We will also open the house for cultural events, including concerts, theatrical events, and poetry readings. Under the umbrella of the museum, I have adopted an artist in residency program of my brother-in-law's gallery in Jermaisi. For local and foreign artists, we're starting this summer with the local ceramist. My studio, which was also damaged during the blast, has been restored by March, Leia Baroudi's charity. We had our first workshop shown here in the garden two weeks ago. And the workshop was for the workers from Tripoli who restored the studio, or still in the process of restoring the studio. And the landscape architect and architect also joined the group, which was great. In order to facilitate the, um, in order to facilitate the salaries of the staff, when we open up as a museum, we will have a shop and a cafe. Uh, I hope you all visit us in Beirut. And I'd like to thank Ali again. I'd also like to thank Hodlo Dower for overseeing the propping and for joining Restart Beirut, a European fund under the umbrella of the King Badwan Foundation, working to raise funds for the restoration, but mostly the collection of the palace. Roderick and I are both on the executive committee and working closely with them. Please visit the website and follow to stay updated on the progress. And we thank Alif again for organizing this very important webinar. Thank you, Mary, for this wonderful presentation. And we definitely are all looking forward to visiting um, the museum. Um, so I am now going to hand over to Ben Cowell, General Director of Historic Houses in United Kingdom, uh, who is going to speak about enterprising houses. Um, ben, over to you. Thank you very much. I will share my screen if I may, but can I ask you to turn your screen share off? Thank you. I hope that looks okay to you. And I will start by thanking the Alif Foundation for inviting me to talk this morning. And thank you to Mary for that inspiring presentation to start us about the Sersok Palace. Uh, my name, as you have heard, is Ben Cowell. I'm Director General of Historic Houses in the UK. And uh, I've called my talk how to live in a historic house and make money, because I want to talk about the different ways privately owned houses in the United Kingdom can uh, survive and thrive and generate the income that they need to sustain the property. So this is an example from the UK that could be of some use uh, in comparison to the Sersok Palace, although obviously the context is very different. Now, the title of my talk actually comes from a book that was published in, I think, 1966 by Lord Montague, who lived at this house. This is Bewley in Hampshire in England. And it was one of the first private houses to open to the public just after the Second World War. And the owner here became a celebrity because of the way he made his private house a public visitor attraction. He ran the house as a museum and he uh, displayed his collection, his personal collection of classic cars and bicycles. And even today, this place is still a popular visitor attraction. In fact, it's called the National Motor Museum. And the museum is now a little bit more popular, I, I would say, than the house itself. In the United Kingdom, 
most of what we call heritage is owned and managed privately. We've got, obviously, we have large heritage charities that look after uh, important heritage assets, but the majority of these assets remain in private hands. And we, my organization, represents about 1,500 historically significant houses all over the United Kingdom. We are effectively a business association representing the owners of these houses. Many of them are open to public visits, but the important thing is they all remain privately owned and they don't receive public funding. So they have to make their own incomes to ensure that they are sustainable. And that's because of course we know that the cost of running uh, one of these houses is enormous. I have a figure here which is expressed in UK currency uh, and is a approximate figure. I think that for each of our member properties they are spending somewhere between £100,000 and £300,000 a year just to keep standing. Uh, these are all the costs of repair and maintenance, as well as heating and lighting and insurance and staffing and so on. This is even before you open to the public. And there is a large backlog of repairs that still need to be done, perhaps 1.3 billion pounds, we estimate. And our job at my organization is to represent these owners and these issues to government. Obviously, we've had a terrible year in the last 12 months because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And lots of houses have lost lots of money. They've lost, we estimated, about six months ago, they lost uh, in the order of a quarter of a billion pounds. And that has led to lots of redundancies, lots of jobs that have been lost. And my member houses are telling me that what they will now do is diversify their businesses. Houses have found ways to open despite the pandemic. Uh, they've been particularly careful to make sure safety precautions are in place when you invite the public to visit a house. You have to be very careful indeed today. And there is now a new interest in the outdoors spaces, in parks and in gardens, and in people being able to visit beautiful open spaces uh, because they've been trapped in their own homes. But I want to now show a few slides just quickly while I have the uh, floor still of the different ways in which houses have diversified and found ways to make income at this difficult time. We've seen a lot of digital enterprises, uh, experiments, houses offering uh, visits through the internet, virtual tours of interior spaces. Uh, some of these have been it has been possible to charge for that experience. I think on the left here is Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire. We've had large properties in the United Kingdom running things like drive-in events. Uh, so you can't visit the house, this is Nebworth House, but you can arrive in your car and sit in your car and watch a cinema screen. Uh, and you can do that perfectly safely. Lots of our houses make money out of weddings and weddings are a particular problem at the moment for the COVID-19 regulations. But uh, again, houses have found ways to run successful weddings that are COVID secure. And we hope they can start doing that again soon. Lots of our houses do bespoke tours of properties that might not normally be open to the public. And we have a, a, a platform for this, we call it invitation to view. Let the owner show you around their house and uh, there is a, a fee charge for this but people are very willing to pay because there is a lot of public interest in 
historic houses and in seeing behind the scenes. Some of our houses in the UK have become museums and have operated as art galleries, for example. Here is an example of a Damien Hurst exhibition at Houghton in Norfolk. But others are very commercial. They run uh, highly commercial retail opportunities. For example, this house, which has a bicycle shop in the grounds. And other places are doing interesting things. They are running food and um, uh, cookery lessons in the, in the kitchens of the property. They are offering hospitality, using, often using food that is grown at the property itself. And this is a, a house in Dorset in England, where the cafe, uh, which is housed in this 1930s squash court, all of the produce is grown on site in the walled garden next door. And Mary mentioned just now filming and film and TV work remains a very popular and important source of income for houses in the United Kingdom. And, and actually we've seen this year an increase in the amount of requests for broadcasters and filmmakers and TV production companies to come and use historic properties while they've been closed to public access. I think I'm probably getting close to my 10 minutes, but the important thing is uh, we emphasize in the UK how much these houses contribute to the economic and the cultural life of the nation. In a normal time, our properties welcome something like 27 million visitors a year, and they help to generate a billion pounds of uh, income to contribute to the economy. And this creates nearly 35,000 jobs, which helps to sustain uh, the heritage sector in the UK. So we owe a lot to private owners and their sense of enterprise, entrepreneurship and innovation in finding the ways to open up their houses to the public and in doing that to keep the houses intact, looked after and properly conserved for the future. And it's our mission at Historic Houses to promote their work. So I'm delighted to have been able to talk to you today and I look forward to the discussions that we will have this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Ben. This is fascinating and a lot there to discuss. Um, so, but before we do, I'm going to hand over to Yvonne, uh, who is a director of Effort Academy uh, in the Netherlands. And who is going to talk uh, to us about how to make a dream, a dream of a museum into museum reality. Yvonne, could I invite you to share your screen? Yes. We'll do that. Can you see my screen? Yes, wonderful, thank you. Let's try to put this on uh, slides. Oh, so now wait one second, because now I lost my uh, my text. Uh, one second, please. Um, sorry, this is, and so I have to do this, this because otherwise I lose my text. I hope it is not a big problem. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ali, for organizing this. Thank you, Mary, for uh, your wonderful introduction and Ben as well. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm uh, really sorry that uh, what I'm going to say is only be general because uh, fundraising business, business models and network is uh, uh, different for each museum. And I talk from uh, my experience with the transformation of uh, the mansion uh, out of Melis Weert. But I will be more than happy to, uh, to contribute to uh, all the uh, things that uh, has to be done in um, by Ruth. My name is Yvonne Blum, I'm director of the Heritage Academy in the Netherlands, and before us, I was director of the Museum Ouder Medeswert, and I am a chair of ICOM Demis, an international committee for historic house museums under ICOM. Uh, Oudermeersweer is a centuries-old mansion located on the banks of the Kromer Rhine River in a beautiful scenery close to the city centre of Utrecht in the heart of the Netherlands.
It is an ensemble, what we call an ensemble of a, a house uh, and a coach house in a garden in partly formal uh, style and a naturalistic, uh, naturalistic English landscape style. style. If, as, you, uh, as you see, pictures are before restoration started in 2011. As you see, nettles are thriving. Though the site history dates back to the 13th century, the present mansion was built in 1770 by a nobleman, Sir Taz van Amerong, you see him on the left. Later owners were King Louis and Napoleon, the Netherlands were on the French predominance, and the Bos van Drakenstein family. They owned it until the beginning of the World War II. Taz van Amerong had strong connections with the East Indian Company and he has enriched the walls of the first floor of the mansion with unique Chinese and European wallpapers. The, museum, the house became a cultural crossroad between East and West, like I saw in uh, uh, Sir Palace. After the war, the municipality of Utrecht bought the mansion and opened up the gardens for the local community. Uh, the, there was no furniture left in the house. The house, they, the house they rented out to a private family. Grounds remained very popular by visitors. After the family moved out in the 80s, the house was temporarily used as a place for art and as artists and resident. Famous artists and filmmakers came and temporary exhibitions happened now and then. The downside to this was that the wallpapers got extremely damaged and the house got in disrepair. A step aside, from 1990 on, I was director of the Armando Museum in Amersfoort, a city close to Utrecht. The museum was admitted to the work of the international renowned artist, writer and filmmaker Armando. In 2007, the museum was destroyed by fire. That looked like this. We had to find a new home for the collection. And I want to talk a little bit about fundraising. Um, tips and tricks for the, for the renovation and the museum design, of course, in general, and of course, for my example of Oude Meersweert, create a committee of recommendation to support your fundraising. Look for influential politics, cultural heritage. Make a list of possible funds, local, international, public and private. Relate your needs to the mission of the funds. Divide up, oh, sorry. Divide the pie of the budget you need in parts per fund. Start to acquire the biggest part. Once you have the biggest part, other parts will follow. Start a public fundraising campaign also. Let people contribute like pebbles for the resurrection of the palace. By doing this, you get ambassadors and maybe volunteers for your museum later. And share every success with press and community. Create a newsletter uh, and the mailing list. Back to our Mill Sphere. 2011 saw the beginning of the restoration of the mansion and the coach house on the forecourt. And then our joint journey started, and me from Amersfoort and the County Council of Utrecht started work together. My intention was to reopen the beautiful building to the public in converting it into a museum for the work of Armando, with the preservation of the world papers being of the utmost importance. Based for the restoration and use for a museum where the monumental values of mansion and interior were not to be affected. First, all the wallpaper layers dating from 1770 to 1980 at the first and second floor were examined and documented in situ. Priceless Chinese wallpaper was removed from the wall and after restoration in the house replaced. The other wallpapers were after documentation covered with a transparent lining so that they still can be experienced and seen. We developed high technical solutions and for climate and light, automatically opening and closing of the shelves at the outside and screens inside, but also no heating, or not even in winter, ticket office, museum shop and museum cafe in the coach house, not in the main house not more than 75 visitors at a time. After four years of hard work, Mary will have a, a difficult job, but it is, it, it is worth. After four years of hard work, the Museum Oude Meersweert opened up as a, as a museum for the work of Armando. His collection finally got a new home. 
In the museum, we displayed the art in harmony with the two other collections. Mansion with all its cultural and heritage values and the collection of wallpapers. It was a house of art in nature. Getting it up and running, tips and tricks. After the museum is almost open, uh, uh, ready to open up, start with visitors research. Who will be your visitors? Who will be your audience? Be aware that if, you, that if you are not the Louvre, the most visitors will be local. Think global, but act local. Create a realistic budget, not a wishful thinking budget. Start small, focus first on opening up, not on a big program. Uh, focus always on quality, not on quantity. Arrange your budget for every, the, for the every month remaining cost first. If you need donors for your museum or program, make an attractive, attractive proposition. Staff is the most expensive. Make use of local vol volunteers as much as possible. Organize temporary exhibition to seduct visitors to come back, but not too, not too much. Uh, shop, best-selling products, fridge magnets, postcards and catalogs is my experience. And use the most budget staff for where you expect most income. Back to uh, the museum. Uh, this is the entrance and the kitchen on the right. Not only Armando was displayed, we made also exhibitions with Armando and other artists. Here you see views from exhibitions, from the exhibition with very talented um, taxiderm taxidermist uh, artists. And another exhibition with, um, sorry, uh, it's quite slow, the presentation, I'm so sorry. Where is my... Um... I don't know why it's not good for the I will tell you. Okay, so um, the attic became a wonderful welcoming space for the library and the archive for documentation center for Armando's work and literary, literature. The, all servants' rooms in the museum, in the house, were uh, used for uh, resi residence and wallpaper history in the old servants' rooms. I would like to show you this picture as well. Did you see this beautiful interior and the beautiful enfilade in the museum? As I told you, uh, due to the extreme high monumental values, the ticket shop, the office, and the cafe were located in the former coach house and stable which was an amazing transformation, again, with respect for the, uh, the heritage value and the, uh, of the site. For the work we did, we got the uh, Europa Nostra Award. This is the highest price you can get in Europe for the restoration and renovation and new use of cultural heritage. But, I know. So when it comes to network, I only have, the, I have one minute left. Um, network, your local community, engage them. They are so important for you. Use ICOM International, I know you already do, but also ICOM Demis. We have 500 historic house museums all over the world to support you. Other ICOM committees, conservation, museology, climate, safety, they are there to help you. Other museums local, other cultural and heritage institutions local private companies and institutions that you support your mission. I'm very sorry that I have to tell you that the museum or the ministry didn't succeed to remain open because the rent we had to pay to the city center of Utrecht was much too high. But still the building is there and there's another foundation now that is going to open up the building again and make it an exhibition space. Um, there's a lot more to say, but for now, I would like to thank you for your attention. If I can be of any help from my Heritage Academy now or from ICOM Demis, please let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Yvonne. This is really wonderful um, and captivating presentation. Thank you. Uh, I am now going to hand over to Luma Hamdan, who is the director of Darat al Alfonon Foundation in Jordan. Um, Luma, over to you. I invite you to share your screen. I don't know if Luma can hear us. Oh, yes.
Luma, we can hear you. Might you be muted? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your introduction, Maja, and thank you fellow panelists for your interesting presentations. I hope to be able to contribute with our experiences in the region of restoring uh, historic houses uh, and building an infrastructure for Arab and art, uh, Arab art and artists. Uh, Darat al Funun, the Khalid Shuman Foundation, is a home for the arts and artists from the Arab world. It's the first of its kind nonprofit private initiative in the region. It was founded and led by artist Suha Shoman since 1988 to support Arab artists, mainly in the conflict zone of Bilad Sham. From the very start, we became a meeting place for Arab artists. Our first five years of experience were crucial in formulating the concept of Dalat al -Funun. Since then, we have grown organically with the needs of the artists and the evolving art scene of the Arab world. My talk today will focus on two aspects that I believe are the most relevant for this webinar. The restoration of historical buildings and antiquities of our compound and the various ways in which we offer artists and researchers residency opportunities. I will begin by showing you the Darat Funun compound. In the early 90s, we restored three of the oldest historical buildings in Amman, dating from the 1920s and the remains of an archeological site of a Byzantine church built over a Roman temple in the garden. Our main building before and after restoration, our specialized art library, some examples of exhibitions in the main building, our archeological site before and after restoration, the site is also used as a venue for the performing arts. The Blue House, which is also used as an exhibition space. A view of Amman from our gardens. When Dar Khaled was restored in 1995, it became our residency building. The inside. 16 years later, to accommodate the growing needs of the artists, to provide a place for researchers and to house artworks from the Khaled Roman collection, we restored two more traditional buildings, the headquarters and the Beit al-Bayruti. Our headquarters before and after restoration, with a cafe area before and after restoration, a view of the inside and the office of our researchers. The Beit al Beiruti before and after restoration. In 2018, we concluded our 30th anniversary by inaugurating at the Beit al Beiruti the museum, art, architecture, archaeology. As part of our expansion, we also restored a series of old warehouses in 2011 that became an experimental space called the lab. And in, in 2013, we added an apartment building for fellows and artists in residence. With these last additions, our compound today includes six buildings and an archaeological site together covering more than 5,000 square meters. Our renovations preserve Jordan's architectural and cultural heritage and give, and give us a wide opportunity for showing art and for hosting artists and researchers. This leads me to talk about our residencies. When talking about our residency program, it's important to stress that we have different ways in which we offer artists and researchers the space to develop their practice, as listed here on the slide. I will briefly discuss each of these categories. Our first artist in residence was Sudanese artist Omar Khalil, who stayed with us for his 1993 exhibition. 
Over the years, we have had many artists stay in residence with us, including Etel Adnan and Simon Fattal, Farid Bilkahia, Marwan Qassab Bashi, Rashid Qureishi, Muna Hatoum, Amal Kinnawi, Tari Atawi, Walid Shawki, and Emily Jasser. They stayed with us to produce works for their exhibition, to give talks or workshops, and to engage with our activities and the local art scene in Amman. Many of these artists had their first solo exhibition in the region at Dar al In 2013, for our 25th anniversary, we engaged in a wider, a wider scope of exchange with the south of the world. Here are some of our more recent residents. Since 1999, we have also collaborated with several international institutions in residency exchange programs, such as UNESCO Ashberg Bursaries for Artists, Pro Helvetia, Nuovo Incona in Venice, and Fondazione Fotografia di Modena in Italy. We hold an annual open call for projects by young artists at the lab that engage with the community or or interact with the public. Artists at the lab from outside Amman also stay in our residency building. In 2011, we established the Dar al-Funun Dissertation Fellowship for modern and contemporary Arab art to encourage research on modern and contemporary art of the Arab world. The fellowship provides financial support to one or two PhD candidates per academic year. They stay between four to six months in Amman. In 2018, for our 30th anniversary, a public colloquium brought together all our fellows for the first time to examine the ways in which knowledge about modern and contemporary Arab art is generated and disseminated. The findings of our colloquium were recently published in a book documenting our 30th anniversary. In 1999, we launched our Summer Academy which provided a key opportunity for emerging artists to study and work under supervision of the late Syrian artist, Marwan Qassab Bashi. Over four years, more than 60 artists from Jordan, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, and Iraq attended the academy. For many of these artists, it was a formative experience in their career. In 2019, Darat al-Funun relaunched the Summer Academy with a new concept offering 10 to 15 participants from the region the space to develop their practice within a critical setting that encourages experimentation, knowledge sharing, and communal learning. The 2020 program was postponed due to COVID. We just launched an open call for our 2021 Summer Academy as part of our year-long post-colonial ecologies program which is organized around a set of fundamental questions concerning the ecological crisis, systems of value and life futures. Sorry, I just need to drink water. Following the lockdown mandated by the government in March, 2020, we launched a pioneering online residency and exhibition program on the 7th of April entitled Internet of Things, Another World is Possible. Through an online residency and live streaming activities, Internet of Things invoked online and offline spaces for research, collective learning and knowledge production. We concluded in September with an online open studios exhibition and an online zine publication. The first iteration was followed by three more online projects. In October, we opened the Measuring Life Note Toward an Impossible Exchange online program, as well as the After Hours online lab residency. This January, we launched a new online project subdomain to our main website as a platform and space to explore online curatorial, artistic, and publishing practices. And as I mentioned before, we just launched our year-long program post-colonial ecologies that will unfold through multiple exhibitions, an online residency, um, public program, and the Summer Academy. I would like to conclude with the words from one of the artists who accompanied, accompanied us 
on our journey and spend time with us in residency, both for our 25th and 30th anniversary, Rayan Tabet. <laughs> So I'm here in the context of uh, the um, 25 year exhibition of the um, of the Dalat al Fumun, and uh, within that, uh, you know, for that show, uh, uh, Adriano Pedrosa invited a, a set of 14 uh, young artists from uh, mostly the South Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere of the world, uh, i.e., the margins, to come and have a series of conversations over the course of two months. So um, to do kind of residencies, but also a more intense uh, discussion between, between um, the 14 of us in two groups of seven. The space that the data offers both uh, as a physical space, but also what's more important is that it offers a mental space. Because a lot of, um, a lot of artists, whether they are Arab artists or not, uh, but definitely artists from the margins come from places which are fraught with um with issues that might affect your uh the clarity of your thoughts and so what i mean by mental space is that the direct offers you like this oasis to think in a way uh and that's how i i experienced it in during the months that i was here thank you so much for listening thank you Thank you so very much, Ruman. This is absolutely fascinating and um, very rich and lots to discuss again. Um, but uh, again, before we do, uh, let me hand over to Laure Bartholomew Leboeuf, uh, curator from, of, of Villa Efruzzi in France. Um, Laure, uh, I will ask you to share your screen. I will. Thank you. Did you see it? I think it's... Uh, Did you see it? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Here we are. Um, so, sorry. So, thank you very much to Halif and to Merit. Uh, I'm very honored to be part uh, of this webinar. I will continue in French, I'm sorry, because um, the time... <laughs> Uh, let's go faster, and um, my English is too um, long. Um, donc, je suis Laure Barthélemy Labéou, je suis la responsable des collections de la Villa Efrosi de Rothschild, qui est la, la possession de l'Académie des Beaux-Arts. La, la Villa Efrosi de Rothschild a été construite par Béatrice Efrosi de Rothschild euh, entre 1907 et 1912. Euh, sur la presqu'île de Saint-Jean-Cap-Ferrat, euh, située entre Nice et Monaco, dans le sud de la France, euh, sur la Méditerranée. La situation de la villa est un domaine de 7 hectares, euh, avec jardin et, euh, et villa ouverte au public depuis euh, 1934, avec euh, une interruption pendant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, où la villa a subi de, nombreux, de nombreuses déflagrations de bombes Euh, qui ont soufflé euh, entièrement toutes les, toutes les fenêtres. Et un pillage dû à, à l'armée euh, allemande. Euh, la villa donc, a été léguée euh, en 1934 euh, avec l'ensemble des collections de Béatrice et Frosty de Rothschild qui comprenaient euh, cinq, euh, quatre collections, c'est-à-dire celles qu'elle avait conçues, euh, créées pour la villa et Frosty de Rothschild, mais également celles qui étaient conservées à Paris dans son hôtel particulier de l'avenue Foch, qui était constitué de tapisseries. Euh, euh, de tapisserie flamande du XVIe siècle, de tapisserie des gobelins, entre autres, euh, de toute sa porcelaine de Sèvres euh, et de mobilier XVIIIe, euh, puisque c'était une de ses passions, euh, ainsi que les collections qui étaient conservées dans ces deux villas monégasques, euh, 
<rire> la villa, euh, ces villas conservaient euh, des, des collections euh, de ferronnerie euh, du, du Moyen-Orient et du Maghreb, euh, ainsi que euh, des collections euh, lapidaires, euh, notamment d'albâtre. Euh, pour la villa Efrosé de Rothschild, Béatrice euh, avait euh, conçu euh, un décor réellement avec euh, je, je montre, voilà, un patio et euh, volontairement euh, toute sa collection de primitifs italiens et espagnols. Euh, donc en 14e, 15e siècle, les serres, euh, les salons et, et les, pièces, euh, les pièces de réception euh, et les chambres au premier étage. Le... We appear to have a bit of a problem, technical problem with um, Law's connection. Um, Law, can you hear us? I think she dropped out. I will, I will try to get in touch with her. Yeah, she's coming back. She's Excellent. Back. This wouldn't be a proper webinar without any technical issues, so. Not in 2021. <laughs> So perhaps I will take this moment to uh, to give another warm welcome to all our uh, 116 uh, participants um, and to encourage you to submit your questions through question and answer tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I per perhaps a particularly warm welcome to, to, to uh, our colleague from Buenos Aires. Thank you very much for getting up so early to join us. Um, Maya, I'm sorry, I, I lost the, collection, the connection, um, so... <laughs> Look, please don't worry, can we just ask you to slow down a little bit for the uh, translators? Um, yes, but uh, I have a lot to say, so... <laughs> oui, okay. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, en français. Uh, donc, uh, la décision uh, de l'Académie a été de préserver la présentation euh, en période rooms, euh, qui inclut donc de respecter euh, un certain nombre de codes et d'introduire une visite, euh, euh, une visite euh, des lieux euh, tels qu'ils pouvaient être du temps euh, de la de, de Béatrice et Frosty de Rothschild. Il faut savoir que comme nous avons euh, hérité de quatre collections d'environ 5000 œuvres. Euh, il a fallu faire des choix muséographiques qui euh, mélangeaient et les œuvres qu'elle possédait à Paris et euh, à Monaco et les œuvres qui étaient euh, réalisées pour, euh, enfin, qui avaient été choisies pour la villa elle-même. Euh, voilà, ça, là nous sommes au premier étage dans une des chambres, dans, dans deux chambres. Euh, celle de droite est dite la, la chambre directoire avec euh, des boiseries peintes. Euh, extrêmement belle et fragile, je tiens à préciser, euh, et euh, avec une vue sur la baie, de, la baie des Fourmis et la Villa Kérilos euh, à, euh, à Beaulieu-sur-Mer. Euh, je, je, vais, je vais concentrer mon, 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 ma présentation sur euh, comment présenter tout en sécurisant les lieux au maximum. Il faut savoir que la Villa Efrosi de Rothschild en 2019 a reçu 180 000 visiteurs, euh, parfois euh, jusqu'à euh, 4 000 visiteurs euh, jour en été, et que ça devient extrêmement problématique euh, de, de, de gérer les flux euh, de personnes. Donc, il faut mettre une mise, en, une mise à distance du public euh, du point de vue de la sécurité parce que les, les, les visiteurs peuvent euh, euh, cherchent à toucher les œuvres, en fait. Et euh, cette mise à distance à un mètre euh, est vraiment euh, le minimum. Euh, il faut mettre en place une vidéosurveillance dans chaque pièce avec un accès euh, à un PC sécurité euh, une pièce qui est totalement dédiée aux agents, à la vidéosurveillance et à tous les tableaux de détection et des alarmes. C'est très important. Euh, les agents de sécurité qui tournent dans les espaces 
euh, parce que certes, la vidéosurveillance et euh, toutes, les, toutes les alarmes que vous allez pouvoir mettre en place, qui sont indispensables, euh, sont nécessaires, mais la présence d'un agent de sécurité euh, peut limiter euh, les interactions entre le public et les collections. J'entends les interactions euh, euh, toucher une œuvre. Euh, il faut évidemment mettre en place une détection incendie avec des, des extincteurs à portée de main pour les, pour les agents de sécurité. Les alarmes intrusion sont indispensables, euh, les radars, les infrarouges et les fixations anti-vol pour les œuvres. Ça suppose un budget annuel d'entretien qui est inaliénable. Vous ne pouvez pas vous passer de ce budget, vous ne pouvez pas vous passer de ces infrastructures. Et ce budget pour la villa, euh, ce budget sécurité pour la villa, euh, hors gardiennage euh, H24, 7 jours sur 7, est d'environ 30 000 euros par an. Donc ça, c'est important. Euh, et euh, euh, malheureusement, euh, on ne peut pas le réduire. Euh, et donc, donc ça, ça fait partie de votre budget euh, impondérable et primitif chaque année. Euh, ça, c'est quelques images de ce qu'on a pu mettre en place à la villa. Donc, euh, nous avons des cordons qui, sont, euh, qui délimitent les espaces visiteurs et les espaces euh, exposition. Euh, nous avons euh, une vidéosurveillance euh, en haut à droite, vous avez euh, les petites caméras, euh, et euh, différents systèmes de radar, euh, ainsi que euh, des évidemment, les, les extincteurs. Euh, pour les, les infrarouges de détection euh, un bras qui, qui passe euh, le, la zone réservée euh, aux visiteurs. Euh, il y a différents systèmes, je ne vous montre pas euh, notre système à nous pour un point de vue de sécurité, mais euh, nous avons, euh, voilà, il existe différents systèmes qui sont extrêmement efficaces, qui peuvent être liés aussi à tout ce qui est système d'accroche, euh, et tout ça peut être... Euh, Aujourd'hui, les technologies font que tout est en Wi-Fi et, euh, et donc ça se passe relativement bien, mais ça a un coût, notamment d'entretien de, chaque année, euh, les logiciels, etc., etc. Pour la conservation des collections, euh, il faut évidemment tenir à jour euh, l'inventaire euh, des collections avec la localisation des œuvres dans le musée. J'y reviendrai plus tard, le marquage systématique des œuvres parce que c'est important. Le contrôle de la température et l'humidité relative des espaces, ça c'est ce qu'on appelle la conservation préventive, ainsi que le contrôle des insectes, et assurer une veille sanitaire des œuvres exposées et en réserve. Ça peut être fait par des professionnels de la conservation comme, comme moi par exemple, mais également, et moi j'engage aussi à ça, à avoir une veille sanitaire coordonnée entre les conservateurs et des restaurateurs qui pourraient avoir un, un contrat annuel de surveillance sanitaire. Euh, J'insiste, euh, j'ai insisté sur un point qui, euh, dans lequel je suis en, euh, euh, que je suis en train de moi de mettre en place pour la Villa et aussi, qui est la mise en place d'un plan de sauvegarde des œuvres. Alors, la situation du Palais sur Soc est extrêmement particulière, mais je pense que pour les années qui viennent, surtout après avoir réouvert au public, il vous faudra envisager euh, la mise en place de ce plan de sauvegarde des œuvres, qui est un plan avec implantation des chefs-d'œuvre à sauver en premier, un matériel de conservation préventive à avoir. Mais je sais que déjà, euh, grâce à, au Blue Shield, vous avez déjà euh, un pied dans ce plan de sauvegarde des œuvres. Donc, voilà. Là encore, c'est un budget euh, de conservation qui est inaliénable, c'est-à-dire tout ce qui est contrôle de température, contrôle d'insectes euh, est important. Il doit être fait euh, en continu tous les ans, renouvelé quand il le faut. L'investissement est important. Ensuite, euh, il est modulable dans le temps euh, chaque année en fonction des besoins des collections. Là encore, je vais insister sur euh, la restauration des œuvres. On peut s'appuyer, en tout cas en France, mais euh, je pense qu'au euh, au Liban, euh, vous allez pouvoir mettre tout ça en place, c'est-à-dire du mécénat. Vous allez mettre en place du mécénat et des volontariats euh, pour euh, l'entretien des œuvres, pour euh, les visites, pour euh, tout ça. Il faut créer un petit budget pour euh, les restaurations d'œuvres et euh, les restaurations des boiseries, l'entretien des boiseries et tout ça. Ça, c'est primordial et euh, le mécénat fonctionne très bien. Et les gens, généralement, quand ils deviennent amis du, amis du musée, euh, vont chercher à euh, vous aider euh, dans, ce, dans, cette, euh, dans, dans, dans ce calendrier. 
Donc ça, c'est des petites choses qu'on a mises en place pour la température et l'humidité relative, puisque nous, à la Villa Effroussi, on est entouré de mer. Et en été, on a, on a beaucoup de chaleur et d'humidité relative. On peut, aller, on peut monter jusqu'à 40 degrés dans les salles d'exposition et avoir 70 à 80 d'humidité relative en été et descendre à, actuellement, la salle où je me trouve, il fait 9 degrés et on a 25 d'humidité relative et il y a énormément de vent dehors. Donc, c'est euh, voilà, la particularité, c'est les variations de température et d'humidité relative qui peuvent être préjudiciables pour les œuvres. Elles s'adaptent, certaines œuvres s'adaptent. Euh, à droite, vous avez euh, une présentation de lac, euh, de, de, lac de, Car de Coromandel, euh, un paravent du XVIIe siècle. Euh, ce paravent, lui, subit réellement euh, les aléas euh, et les variations climatiques, ce qui fait que nous allons être obligés, outre de le restaurer, mais dans sa prochaine présentation, de, de, mettre en place, euh, de le mettre dans une pièce euh, qui aura un climat plus stable. Et ça aussi, c'est à prendre en compte. Euh, pour les insectes, vous avez beaucoup de choses qui existent aujourd'hui. Euh, à droite, les flagstraps pour les expositions, euh, l'insectron au centre pour les réserves. Euh, et nous, dans nos réserves, on a mis en place depuis maintenant cinq mois euh, ce qu'on appelle l'aérocide qui va créer un mouvement d'air tout en purifiant l'air puisque nous avions des problèmes d'humidité de, relative trop importante et euh, de, je l'avoue, de moisissure. Et du coup, euh, ce, cet appareil euh, permet d'assainir l'air de manière extrêmement efficace puisqu'aujourd'hui, euh, la, le climat des réserves est totalement stable à 18 degrés, 60 d'humidité relative et, euh, et un air beaucoup plus sain. Je sais que je suis navrée pour cette interruption euh, de, de présentation. Euh, je voulais vous, vous signaler parce que euh, moi, je m'appuie beaucoup sur eux euh, dans ma vie de quotidienne de conservation. Euh, vous êtes déjà en lien avec l'ICOM. Comme l'a dit Yvonne, euh, il y a un vrai support au sein de l'ICOM. Euh, il y a aussi euh, le VADEMECOM mis en place par le CDRMF euh, français, qui est un centre de recherche des musées, euh, des musées nationaux français, un VADEMECOM sur la conservation préventive et la conservation générale des œuvres, euh, qui nous donne euh, un, une ligne directrice à suivre avec des, des préceptes qui sont très facilement... Euh, mis en place. Donc ça, c'est très important. L'organisation des réserves, euh, et là, je, je vous invite, Marie, à prendre contact avec Gaël Le Guichin de l'ICROM, euh, qui est euh, un homme absolument délicieux et euh, qui euh, travaille sur la réorganisation des réserves de tous les musées du monde, euh, notamment ceux qui ont euh, très, très peu de moyens. Moi, personnellement, je... Je suis Gaëlle Le Guichin pour mes réserves que je dois entièrement reconditionner. Et c'est une façon d'organiser les choses qui est extrêmement simple à mettre en œuvre et extrêmement efficace. Évidemment, la protection des œuvres, vous êtes déjà avec le blue chip. Moi, je l'avais juste rajouté pour les autres les autres musées, euh, villas, musées, palaces, musées, euh, qui peuvent participer à ce webinaire. Euh, il s'agit de, de, du bouclier bleu en français, qui euh, est une, un organisme bénévole qui travaille euh, avec des restaurateurs qui œuvrent pour la sauvegarde euh, des, des, des collections, notamment quand il y a euh, un impact climatique ou un accident, euh, voire pire, comme pour, le, comme pour le palais sur Soc. Je vous remercie tous, je suis, excusez-moi encore pour cette interruption euh, de connexion Internet, ce sont les aléas de la technique, euh, et Maya, à vous. Merci Laura, merci, sur, uh, sorry, wrong language. Thank you Laura, thank you very much for... For soldiering on, I'm very sorry for the technical issues. I think there always has to be one uh, during every webinar. I'm sorry it felt to you. Uh, thank you everyone for one absolutely wonderful presentations. And thank you for the questions already submitted to uh, through chat and through questions and answers. 
I'm delighted that we have Dr. Uh, Anne-Marie Athesh, Director General um, of the uh, General Council of Museum Lebanon with us. And we will ask, uh, she has, well, she has very kindly agreed to provide closing remarks at the end of the discussion. Um, but now let's move to the discussion and let's, uh, let's start with the questions. There are a lot of questions and I think perhaps we can start with the questions focusing on the audience. Um, there is, um, I, I will be paraphrasing questions and trying to uh, combine them if possible. Um, I see a, a wonderful question from Katrin Leonard about the, in, uh, about the focus on local visitors and community. Uh, this question is make, uh, makes an important point on uh, the importance of authentic and lasting en engagement of the local communities. And um, Katrin is asking, what are uh, the Sursok uh, Palace team plans for engaging the local communities? And Mary, if I may add to this, um, could you tell us a little bit more about how do you see the Sursok Palace Museum in the ecosystem of other museums and cultural institutions of Beirut? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, we actually are unique in, in respect to different museums in the community. On our street alone, we're across the street from the Sersak Museum, which houses a contemporary art collection. And that building was built in the 1950s. Um, so they have some community uh, activities. We have a, a large garden, and this is a big plus. The garden is 7,500 square meters, and Beirut is a very urban city. So it's a green oasis within a very dense urban uh, environment. And we would like to offer families and different people different uh, workshops and activities within the garden. So uh, such as city uh, roof gardening, because uh, we are in a dense city, so how can they use their roof or terrace? Uh, city composting, gastronomics, and um, health or yoga uh, activities for families. So we would like to offer that externally. And then internally, We'll also have things uh, which community small groups can do. In the winter, actually, we have uh, we sponsor a charity every year called Help and Heal, and at Christmas time they have gingerbread house making. This is a huge attraction in Beirut. Uh, we have kids that come and they have their birthday party, so they invite ten or twelve of their friends. They all get a house to decorate, and then they go home with their individual houses. So I know that there is um, a market for the use of the garden uh, and offering it to the community for different purposes. And we definitely plan to, um, to do that. Thank you so very much, Mary. Um, the, uh, is there any, perhaps I can open it up to other panelists and to, to ask you to, to speak from your experience about the, this question of local community involvement. Yes, may I, if I may say something? I think it's important not only to think about what you can um, what you can do for the local community, but also what they can do for the museum and get them involved as volunteers. But um, so to make them part of this process and uh, engage them them to be part of this process in 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 as much ways as possible. And so not only by organizing things for them, but ask them what they can do for you. And on the other hand, I think it's really very important to reach out to the local community because they are the most close. And I think the biggest audience will, will get from there. Um, many museums, and actually I did the same. We are thinking that our visitors will come from abroad, uh, but most of them will come uh, from out the direct surroundings of the museum. And about relevance, uh, if the museum is aware of the needs of the community and thinks about uh, what the collection, what the museum can do for this, the needs of the community, you will be, uh, you will stay more relevant. And if you stay more relevant, you will be, you will be more sustainable in many ways. Thanks. Thank you, Yvonne. I was wondering if uh, Luma, do you have anything to? 
add to this? I mean, we're actually located uh, um, in in uh, the city center. We overlook the the heart of Amman, so we are um, in in the heart of Amman, and we we are there to engage the community with our weekly uh, activities. Um, so uh, we try to remain relevant of what's happening around politically, economically. Um, we always uh, we hold exhibitions. We we try to um, engage the community by having them appreciate the art uh, and and the evolving local scene because we were one of the first who um, uh, supported. Uh, or, sh or have shown uh, contemporary Arab art. Uh, it's, it's very diverse. We show uh, diverse um, types of art from installation to video art to conceptual art. And that's all new and it adds a lot to the community and they, they always look forward to come to our space and to engage with us. Wonderful. I think that this is, um, I, um, maybe we can also ask Ben um, uh, to, I'm sorry to call you out, but I think that I rather suspect you have a lot to, uh, a lot of insights from, from historic houses. Oh, I think we might have lost Ben. Um, in, in such case, I, uh, perhaps I will move to a question which has been asked very early in the in the discussion, and it's a question which references uh, something that Yvonne mentioned about visitors' research. research. Um, so, uh, I wonder if Yvonne could tell us a little bit more about this, um, specifically about about the ways of doing research. Um, I think this. This might be very interesting for a new museum, uh, such as the Plan uh, Sursak Palace Museum. Yes, uh, yes, of course. Um, yes, we did uh, research because, uh, uh, um, you know, the grounds uh, that surrounded, the gardens that surrounded uh, the Oude Meesweerd mansion uh, attracted one million visitors a year every year. So we were thinking these visitors will not be a problem at all. They will come automatically. That is not true. So you have to be aware of what would be your possible audience, amount of your possible audience be. And you have to do research for that. That means you have to look what other facilities, what other museums, institutions, shops, whatever are in the surroundings. And is there room for, uh, uh, in this case, the source of palace? Or is there enough, are there enough other things? So you have to be aware of what can we contribute that is not there already, that's not there yet. And how many possible visitors we will, uh, can attract. We did some, uh, it sounds a little bit <laughs> weird in uh, this challenging time, but we did like lifestyle research. So what do people need? Uh, do they, uh, is there a need for more like uh, a big cafe or is there more need about uh, arts? And um, you can do this with lifestyle research. And uh, we found out that we had a possible audience visitors amount of 30,000, which is only a very, very small part of this 1 million visitors that already visited the grounds since years. It's not the same visiting the gardens and visiting the museum. So there are many other tools of doing a visitor's research, but the, the, the thing is, uh, you have to research what is needed in the, in, the, in, the, in the surroundings, what is still there. Is there room, is there space for, uh, for the thing you want to achieve? Uh, how big is that amount? How many visitors you can uh, attract? And please focus local because international visitors, uh, 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 not only in COVID, but in general, it's only for small museums, for big museums, only for a small part of, the, uh, part of the museums, they attract international visitors. So the biggest audience is in your direct surroundings. And uh, well, I can I can uh, give you more tools for visitors research, but I think it's important because I read that the Sussex Palace had to be uh, financially independent after it's up and running. So you have to be aware how much visitors, groups, families, whatever you can attract to the max, so that you know what your possible budget and income will be after you opened up the museum. 
goodness, thank you so very much. This is very, this is fascinating. I also wonder if I, if we could ask Dr. Uh, Anna Afesh to perhaps um, add something to this. If... Uh, yes, sure. I will have. Uh, je, je vais parler français. Donc, uh, il y aurait beaucoup, uh, effectivement, beaucoup de points à, à soulever, à discuter. Et, et surtout, uh, moi, je remercierai uh, tous les panélistes uh, qui ont apporté une contribution uh, à différents niveaux, je dois dire. Uh, d'une part, uh, d'une part, uh, la question des collections. Des, euh, de la scénographie euh, lorsqu'on transforme une demeure en, en, en musée. Et, et d'autre part, euh, toutes les questions liées euh, euh, au financement, euh, telles que soulevées par euh, Ben Cowell, et bien sûr, euh, cette, euh, le dynamisme qu'on est supposé engendrer, qui est supposé engendrer un musée euh, avec les maisons d'artistes et toutes les activités qui vont aller autour euh, de ce musée afin de venir alimenter euh, et être une source de financement telle que euh, relevée par, euh, euh, par tous les intervenants finalement. Et peut-être je reprendrai ceci euh, dans les mots de conclusion tout à l'heure. Thank you so very much. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if any other panelists wants to comment. If not, uh, there, there are a couple of other questions that flow from, from the discussion so far, uh, but please interrupt me if, uh, if you'd like to add something. If not, then there is a question from Professor Anna Leone, uh, uh, which is a bit on the flip side of what we were discussing that is uh, beyond the local communities. Um, Mary, are you planning to use digital tools through website to increase knowledge and awareness of the historic palace and of the exhibition? And um, perhaps this is also something where we could ask Ben to add um, to add a few words from his experience of working with uh, virtual visits to historic palaces. But let's start with Mary, if we can. Okay, right now, uh, we've just had um, a visit last week from uh, UNESCO, and they are going to supply us with a photogrammetry walkthrough of the interior. We've been talking also to um, uh, Google about having a walkthrough of the museum when it's complete. So in terms of digital works, I think that it'd be interesting. We're going to have this walkthrough before the restoration. And then hopefully with Google, we'll be able to have a walkthrough after. So you can visit, you can see the artworks after they've been restored and you'll see the palace pre-restoration. We also plan to have a, um, a video screening room as part of the exhibition space in a separate room, which will have videos on loops of the restoration, which I forgot to mention. Throughout the restoration, we plan on have, having to have a chantier école for each task that has to be um, restored, such as the Baghdadi ceilings, the marble, the um, plaster work, every aspect we'd like to have in a school so that academics, students, professors and um, engineers and architects can come and work with a combination of some foreign experts and some local craftsmen in order to continue these trades being um, learned and being sustainable for future restoration of these heritage homes. <clears throat> sorry, sorry to divert, but uh, I wanted to get that in. And, um, uh, so that's it in terms of digital that we've we've considered uh, to date. What, wonderful! That's um, uh, that seems already quite 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 rich and thoughtful. And I wonder if Ben could, if we could ask Ben to to speak from his experience. I know Ben that we have lost you for a moment, um, so maybe we could also ask you uh, to speak to the local community engagement, at less, as 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 well as uh, to the virtual. Uh, virtual experience and digital tools. Thank you. And this is the problem with digital, I suppose, because my <laughs> Wi-Fi connection completely went just now. I had to go and find a solution. Um, so I'm on my phone. Anyway, um, digital is clearly a really important part that 
every heritage site needs to be thinking about and working with. And the examples I showed were of places that have embraced digital to the extent of having virtual tours. And sometimes these are tours that can be given by curators and effectively a group can be taken around on shown an aspect of a house or shown the totality of the experience through virtual means. I am by no means an expert on these things, but what can be done with 3D imagery today is quite astonishing. And it is well worth experimenting and innovating and trying to find ways of making digital access because then people, you know, you can reach an international audience for your house. And there are houses in the UK that have done exactly this. Um, but of course, um, just to go to the, the local, we find all of, our, all of our member houses have very important local links, which is the opposite of digital, of course. This is about the life of the local area um, and the involvement of a house in the local culture. And the uh, many of our houses, I think the majority of them have community engagements, they have local events, uh, local charity functions, uh, working with local people is absolutely what it's all about because this is, I think, really important uh, for a house to, to survive. It needs that local support. And so owners, we find owners go out of their way to cultivate local, um, local links, working with local schools, for example, local communities, uh, using local craftspeople to work on the property. These are really important aspects which are to be absolutely encouraged. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, ben, can I keep you for a second? I'm not going to let you go, just to, just to follow up on the question of volunteers. This is something which uh, appears to work amazingly well in, United King, in the United Kingdom um, with, uh, with an army of volunteers involved in many historical properties. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? How is it organized and how are these volunteers um, invited, how they are involved, and how they are kept being involved. Yes, thank you. Yes, of course, volunteers also very important. I think perhaps our member properties, they do use um, thousands of volunteers, but it's not perhaps the same scale as you find in the big charities. I'm thinking of the National Trust, which is a very important heritage charity where they have, um, I think it was 70,000 volunteers was the last figure I used. And they have a very effective organizing, organizational system for volunteers, for volunteer recruitment, for volunteer uh, training, for effective working with volunteers. Um, uh, and so I, often our owners do not have such a thing. They have I suppose it's more informal links, but often they can have very close uh, relationships with, with volunteers who often live locally and who might come in to um, offer some voluntary support to look after the garden or to um, help to show people around and things like that. And this is all about how we engage with, with people, of course. It's all about how you welcome people into the house, how you work with people, how you, um, in a sense, think of him, uh, volunteers in exactly the same way you think of your employees. You have the same duty of care. You have the same need to provide training and support and to give that support to volunteers. And it's a mutual relationship. And um, the volunteers give so much. And so it is all about thinking about what you can give back to your volunteers and undoubtedly, Volunteers gain skills, they gain experience, and for some younger volunteers, it can be a, a step on the path to a career in heritage or in conservation. So it's, it's a really important subject as well. 
Thank you so very much, Ben. This is uh, this is wonderful. I don't know if any of the panelists would like to add anything about your experience with, in working with volunteers. Yes, um, if I may, uh, working with volunteers is uh, it's not only um, very important, but I think for most of museums in the world, it is abs absolutely necessary. Uh, because what I said in my presentation, uh, staff is at, at in the Netherlands, I don't know the living in situation, so sorry for that, but in the Netherlands or maybe in Europe, staff is the most expensive part of your uh, budget. So uh, it's, it's very, it's great to work with volunteers, but it's also necessary, but it's also difficult because they all come from their own perspectives, they all come with their own wishes. So you really need, if you need, uh, many uh, volunteers you need a coordinator for that so it's uh, you have to think about that in your maybe in your budget or um, in your staff that there should be someone who uh, organizes and guides and helps and teaches the volunteers uh, because uh, and the other thing you have to think about do I need them for my the running of my museum for all the parts of my museum or only for some parts so that's also a question you have to ask yourself, where do I need them for, where do I need them the most? And uh, be aware of this um, uh, more than, than a few years ago, volunteers are uh, happy to contribute to a project, but um, it's more difficult to attract them for a longer period. So that's also a thing you have to think about. Um, and also important to, to attract younger people uh, uh, volunteers, but that's also quite uh, difficult. So it can be can be challenging working with volunteers, but it's also absolutely necessary, and um, it's also a great contribution to the museum and uh, and to uh, yeah to work together with the community. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Yvonne. I don't know if um, Luma, do you look like you want to add something or? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would like to add uh, to my first uh, answer that we also engage uh, our community via various um, ways. Uh, we have, uh, we hold concerts, uh, we have uh, film screenings, we have uh, um, our main exhibitions that are open to, to the public, we hold workshops, uh, we have our specialized library. Uh, with regards to uh, our virtual work, we have digitized uh, our archives uh, of uh, 30 years, over 33 years of experience of all our um, performances, talks and weekly events, and they are all um, available for researchers when they come and they conduct uh, uh, research at our places. So um, um, we realized that now we need to go digital, especially in this difficult situation. And we were pioneering in that. Uh, uh, and we have reacted uh, back in April. We have now an online program. And all our exhibitions, talks, events, uh, lecture performances are held online since uh, last uh, April. And uh, we really were really investing in that uh, because we need to go with the with what's happening around and to to always uh, remain relevant. So this is extremely important, um, you know, the, the virtual side of, of our work currently. Well, um, yes, as this, as this webinar shows, we, exactly. <laughs> we, we, might, be, we, might, be, uh, uh, we might be still dependent on digital for a while yet. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much. If I may, I will move to a different aspect of a network after working with local community um, with, uh, with volunteers. There is an interesting question from Marie-Yves uh, Didier about the role of ICOM, uh, an ICOM network. Um, Yvonne, I'm afraid this is again to you. Mm -hmm. um, you have touched upon this. So maybe, uh, well, this, let's start with you and uh, could you tell us a little bit more? And maybe Mary can also speak a little bit to how ICOM is already involved in, um, in her project. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, I, I had a talk with Peter Keller a few days ago, Director General of uh, ICOM, ICOM headquarters, and uh, he told me already that they visited uh, Mary, your place, uh, uh, last year. 
And um, so they're really, and, and I know they're involved in this webinar also. Well, because this is the International Committee of Museums, and this is the biggest uh, institution for museum work. Um, and we have 40,000 members. So this is an enormous amount of knowledge of expertise. Uh, ICOM International can be uh, helpful with expertise, with knowledge, with lobbying to, to government. They can put any pressure where it's needed. Uh, ICOM has 32 uh, international committees working on different topics of all the aspects of your project, Mary, about climate, about conservation, about collection, about professionals, about training, volunteers. So it's a, like to say them in French, a mer à boire uh, for your project. And um, I think there will be um, a very uh, uh, um, uh, grateful and happy if they, they could assist. And I, I actually, I don't know where they could not assist because uh, this is our international museum uh, organization and all the knowledge, all the expertise uh, all, and all the lobby, which I think is very important, you can find there. So uh, keep them close to you. And I think they will be very happy to stay close to your project. Mary, would you like to uh, comment? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the information about uh, ICOM. We are, I just, I wasn't sure technically, uh, as we haven't opened yet, whether we were able to access all the information and the resources that ICOM has to offer. So if we can at this junction, that would be most helpful since we are so much in the planning stages of the museum. So, I, I, so Mary, of course, I would just advise you uh, become a, a member of ICOM. So we, you will get access to the website. You will get access to uh, all the information that is there and you will get access to the network. And for me, as Demis this chair, uh, Demis is admitted to uh, historic house museums all over the world. We have more than 500 historic house museums in our network. They all uh, have to, had to experience the same problems as you, and, and we are very happy to assist you. So I would advise you uh, become a member. It is not that expensive to become a member. You can become a private member as a person or an institutional member, and then you will have access to all the, uh, the things. And uh, ICOM is also organizing all the things, uh, digital and virtual, so there will be many, many information that is very useful for you. And you can reach out to them to ask them for all the help you need. And of course, them is to choose them as your, uh, your um, you can choose a few committees, national committees to be part of. But if you choose them as your first committee, uh, you will have 500 colleagues with expertise uh, that can be useful for your project. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anne-Marie, I so your hand got. Yes, I would just like to add to this that there's a uh, national committee in uh, Beirut, of course, for ICOM, and that uh, we will be, uh, of course, willing to help. And we are here to help uh, to follow up with you the whole process. And eventually, then you will be part of the ICOM Lebanon also uh, before uh, joining uh, any committee that, uh, that will help you. Uh, in the process uh, of becoming a museum, definitely so. Thank you, Anne Maria. I forgot, of course, about the national committees. Of course, national committee, Na Lebanon National, is, uh, is is also great. So thank you for adding that. Uh, maybe we can hear also from Laure. Um, Laure, I, uh, I think you muted. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Tell me. Would you like to, I mean, are you part of uh, this network? Uh, no, I'm not yet part of the ICOM, but um, the support of the ICOM for, uh, for the Palace of Sock is uh, fundamental for uh, at the villa. Uh, we, we used to work with uh, the national uh, um, Pardon, je vais continuer en français. Avec les institutions euh, nationales, euh, l'Académie des Beaux-Arts euh, a un accord avec le ministère de la Culture. Donc, nous, a, nous travaillons avec la direction régionale.
sociale, des affaires culturelles. Nous avons un partenariat avec la Fondation du patrimoine français. Voilà, nous avons mis en place un certain nombre depuis, euh, depuis mon arrivée en septembre 2019. Euh, il faut véritablement se rapprocher de toutes ces institutions, Mary, euh, dès maintenant, ne pas attendre l'ouverture pour euh, mettre en place euh, un certain nombre, de, notamment de protocoles pour les collections, j'en reviens juste à, à ma partie perso, vraiment, c'est-à-dire les collections, le, le travail d'inventaire, de, euh, de, de programmation des restaurations, je, c'est énorme ce que vous avez à faire euh, et rapidement. Vous êtes soutenu par le Blue Shield. Vous avez euh, et je suis sûre que l'ICOM va soutenir aussi. Euh, et euh, après, si vous vous dirigez vers euh, Riorg et Gaël de Lichin, ils vont tous vous soutenir euh, pour mettre en place un certain nombre de choses qui vous permettent de travailler sereinement et d'ouvrir sereinement. Euh, le but est de sauver le palais et de sauver les collections et de vous permettre de, de, que ce, ce musée soit euh, euh, matériellement et budgétairement, euh, budgétairement viable. Donc, euh, ils vont, ils, on, on va tout faire pour. On est là pour ça. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Laure. Uh, we have... A, uh, uh, sorry, have I interrupted you? Is there, would you like to add something? Or... Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, the president of ICOM uh, Lebanon. Um, Mary, this is to you. Uh, this, uh, this is just to ask you for a little bit more um, information where you are where, with the reflection on the museum uh, project. Uh, so in terms, especially in terms of points that Yvonne has outlined in her presentation of uh, her, of the of the project uh, of museum, um, how, what are the, what has been done already? What are the next steps specifically in turning the uh, your home into a muse, into a museum? Um, our, our, right now, where we are is we, um, as I showed on my slide, uh, Bivadi is helping us with the uh, safeguarding. They're photographing and wrapping and storing the paintings, which came out to more than 500. And the database has been set up so that in, all of the collection can be put into this database called Access. So the paintings are done. The next stage is to do uh, some objects, decorative objects, and then we'll work on chandeliers, furniture, ceramics, porcelain, and glass. So we have a whole um, line of things that need to be inventoried. And then we will start to uh, organize restoration on these in these different categories. So that's, and this is in parallel with the beginning of the restoration of the house. The north elevation is the most important thing to restore because Internally, we cannot work on walls or ceilings until the building is secure. So the building was uh, pushed out approximately 24 centimeters from the facade and it needs to be put back in place. Now, once this is done and the structure is solidified, then we can start on the restoration internally. Wonderful, Mary. And I, I think that uh, let me uh, also ask you uh, a little bit not, not about the museum, not about the museum as in a building, but the museum as an institution. There was also a question from um, Marie F. Didier about the legal aspects of uh, transforming the uh, uh, Sursak Palace into the Sursak Palace Museum. Um, so, uh, do you, how? <coughs> Is this aspect going to advance? What are the challenges and difficulties? Well, we're very grateful to um, Anne-Marie, who's been guiding us through this entire process from the point of blast. And we have been uh, advised by her, which we've completed, to write a letter of intent to the Minister of Culture. So the Minister of Culture has acknowledged our letter and, uh, and we continue to proceed on our journey to becoming a museum. Uh, once we're open as the museum, then we can uh, 
call ourselves a museum, but at the moment we're, we're on the road to becoming a museum and, uh, and following all of the legal uh, implications that are imposed on us by the Lebanese government. Excellent. Well, that's, uh, uh, well, I, we hope that this process goes smoothly. Um, and one final follow up in terms of, you spoke a little bit about your plans for the visitors, but in terms of research that uh, Yvonne was describing, I mean, you know, has, have there been much exploration of how do you go, how, how to best involve um, the local community and how to best guide the visitors um, considering the situation which is complicated in Lebanon, not only because of the pandemic. Uh, in terms of the volunteers, uh, we, have, we have thought about that quite a bit. Uh, the Victorian Albert Museum is a place I love to go visit. And very often, uh, you know, every hour there's a different tour. And um, I discovered that, there, that these tours that are usually between 30 and 40 minutes are given by volunteers. So um, that these are people that are interested in a particular um, period or a particular collection of the museum. So it would be interesting uh, to engage the community to find out who is who would be willing to give guided tours, which is how we plan to operate in the house, and um, and we'll supplement that with salaried, uh, you know, uh, personnel or staff to give tours as well. Uh, and in terms of volunteers for the garden, um, also done in other cities, is where the elderly community get involved and they participate in say, doing up a particular border. Um, they will decide on the seasonal planting that needs to be done, as well as, you know, I mean, we have gardeners, but they can also participate in looking after or directing the gardeners. Mm -hmm. So we would like to engage people in garden uh, activities uh, between elderly and young to, to there's a, such a lack of green space that um, I think our youth need to be educated about green space and respect the green space because uh, unfortunately we have a pollution problem here and people will throw trash in any green square or garden that exists. So I think that um, this is very important to engage the youth from elementary school age. And since we've been here, we've had busloads of children come through um, every year with their teachers and they just come to enjoy the garden, but we should have more educational um, activities for these kids that are at any rate coming through. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up our discussion. Um, uh, Maya, could I yes? say something? Could I say one thing? Of course, please go ahead. Yes, because you asked me to talk about budget and uh, and running costs and so, uh, Mary, I saw in the documents that uh, you expect the main income from renting the gardens for events and uh, so I think this is maybe the most important part of doing the research for the possibility of those events and how many uh, families or companies or institutions uh, will. Uh, uh, will be doing this in your in your gardens because then you know that you don't need to as much uh, for your uh, for the museum itself so that's important if you think the most income will come out of those renting the gardens you have to find out uh, what the possible amount of events will be in a year and what kind of income you could reach um, and then you could as a, as your wish is um, keep the admission to the museum very low but if the main part of the visitors will be for the museum, then maybe you have to rethink that and make the admission to the museum uh, higher because that's, you know, that's the balance between um, how many visitors uh, or how many groups, how many for the garden, how many for the museums. You have to find out what uh, the amount could be. Even thank you so very much. I'm so sorry to cut you off, but we really need to hand, hand over to Anne-Maria Fesch for her closing remarks. Thank you so very much to all the panelists and all, to all of you who asked the questions. Um, and over to you, Anne-Marie. Thank you once again for agreeing to conclude for us. Thank you.
Alors, euh, je remercie Alif à nouveau qui m'a invité à conclure aujourd'hui ce webinaire portant sur le palais sur Soc et sa future transformation en musée. Les quelques remarques que je soulève émanent donc des interventions des panélistes que nous avons eu le privilège d'écouter ce matin et que je remercie. Alors, nous pourrions euh, en retenir quelques thèmes. Euh, en premier, peut-être on pourrait retenir le thème des collections et les aspects concernant la présentation des œuvres et leur sécurité, soit l'installation géographique au sein du lieu transformé en musée. Et je remercie à cet effet Laure Barthélémy et l'ABE pour l'exemple de la villa et fusil de Rothschild qu'elle a remarquablement présenté. Donc, la conservation des œuvres, leur restauration, la mise en valeur reste bien sûr des priorités au sein de tout projet muséal. Dans le cas des demeures anciennes, il y a le souci de préserver l'authenticité de la présentation et de trouver le juste équilibre entre la résidence qu'elle fut dans le passé et la scénographie plus moderne qui doit convenir à sa nouvelle mission. Dans le cas du palais sur soc et tel que présenté ce matin par Mary Cochrane, la réhabilitation du bâtiment ravagé par l'explosion du 4 août se fera en parallèle à la remise en état des collections et nous parlons ici de collections de peintures, mobilier, de tapisseries, des tapis et de manière générale des biens culturels de type et de périodes diverses. Et la future scénographie s'attachera à respecter l'authenticité de cette demeure, tout autant que sa préservation et sa sécurité, bien sûr, pour mettre en valeur son aspect historique, social, architectural et artistique, bien sûr. Le deuxième point à retenir de ce webinaire est l'aspect relatif à la gestion administrative et financière d'un musée et le développement de ressources et de sources de financement pour assurer la pérennité d'un projet. Et là, Ben Cowell a parfaitement fait tableau en mentionnant les diverses possibilités qui alimentent la survie des maisons historiques ouvertes au public. Il y a de gros efforts. À faire. Il y a un mécénat consistant et constant et permanent. Euh, un plan de gestion propre à chaque musée est nécessaire, effectivement. Et dans ce sens, et pour soutenir le projet du Palais sur Soc, la fondation Restart, qui a été initiée en décembre 2020, s'est mis comme but d'apporter un soutien au projet du Palais sur Soc en levant des fonds afin d'assurer des expertises adéquates pour la restauration des œuvres d'une part, et pour la, poursuivre le processus de la création euh, du musée d'autre part. Bien sûr, le soutien aux futures activités qui donneront vie à ce musée, comme les résidences d'artistes, euh, les ateliers de restauration, euh, les organisations de concerts, d'expositions, est également prévu. Et là, ce sont les institutions, les universités qui pourraient euh, toutes être de connivence et euh, entrer dans ce processus. Et à cet effet, on ne peut que euh, rappeler l'importance des activités qui a été particulièrement soulignée par Luma Hamdan et dans le cadre du travail exceptionnel à Telfunun Amman. Et euh, le but, effectivement, est de développer des compétences au niveau euh, des métiers d'art, mais aussi d'encourager les artistes et euh, de les promouvoir, de promouvoir leur œuvre. Euh, ceci, euh, bien sûr, avec une ouverture. Euh, comme pour euh, David El Fenoun, euh, à la recherche, euh, à partir des archives, etc. C'est également l'objectif de Mary Cochrane, qui nous faisait part de son souhait de s'investir dans la formation, dans des formations professionnelles, durant ce, ce, au cours de cette restauration, et bien sûr dans des événements culturels. Et enfin, je relèverai de l'intervention d'Yvonne Plum, euh, qui a présenté une expérience particulière, finalement, dans un lieu comme le musée euh, Oum al d'une demeure transformée en musée, où le visiteur est immergé vraiment dans l'art, dans l'histoire, dans la nature, et, et, et de trouver finalement les bonnes solutions adéquates avec euh, un bon programme et un budget réaliste pour chacun euh, de ces projets. Tout ceci, bien sûr, euh, est un défi euh, pour d'une part préserver l'authenticité et d'autre part euh, respecter les normes muséales. Et là, on ne peut que euh, euh, soutenir et être reconnaissant envers, euh, euh, envers l'ICOM des MIS euh, qui devra soutenir et suivre un petit peu ce processus avec toutes les expertises qu'il pourra amener euh, dans ce cadre. Alors, bien sûr, euh, 
ce qui est prévu pour le futur musée euh, du palais sur Soc est quelque peu similaire euh, à cette démarche parce qu'il faut finalement définir une mission et euh, il faut jouer euh, un rôle, il y a tout un rôle à jouer au sein de la société avec une ouverture bien sûr à un public inclusif euh, en, en alternant bien sûr l'importance de la communauté euh, euh, de, pour qu'elle puisse participer et réfléchir finalement à ce rôle et cette nouvelle mission de, de ce musée. Et euh, enfin, je, je dirais que la place et la spécificité du futur musée du palais sur Soc dans le monde des musées libanais euh, est unique. Et je vais vous dire pourquoi ce, ce, ce futur musée serait unique. D'abord, c'est le seul palais d'une telle envergure au sein de notre capitale Beyrouth. Et euh, il est caractérisé par une architecture particulière et il est riche d'une collection italienne baroque exceptionnelle remarquable. Euh, vous savez, dans ce moment, dans un moment de grande précarité, d'incertitude et de crise inégalée euh, que nous vivons aujourd'hui au Liban, on peut ici envisager un nouveau type de musée pour le pays. Euh, alors aussi où la définition des musées est au cœur de nos discussions euh, dans le monde des professionnels du musée, la porte est ouverte à une, une création qui serait la création d'un palais musée privé avec une nouvelle approche qui constituerait donc un modèle unique au Liban dans le respect des institutions. Et nous sommes surtout ici en présence, et je conclurai sur ceci, nous sommes ici en présence d'un palais toujours habité par la famille d'origine, qui raconte son histoire, certes, mais aussi qui raconte l'histoire de plus de deux siècles de la ville de Beyrouth, en reflétant l'ouverture de notre Orient sur l'Europe. Et pour conclure, je remercierai à nouveau Alif Elikom pour ce webinaire, tous les intervenants qui ont largement éclairé, qui nous ont largement éclairé sur les possibilités qu'offre une demeure ou un palais lorsqu'on décide de l'ouvrir au public et par conséquent lorsqu'elle ou il devient musée. Je vous remercie. Thank you so very much, uh, Anmadi, for this wonderful conclusion. Um, and all that remains now is to thank all the panelists um, and all the uh, participants who sent very stimulating, wonderful questions. And of course, uh, many thanks to our wonderful translators for helping us understand each other and having a really productive and lively discussion. And finally, I would like to thank to my two colleagues, Alexandra and Andrea, who are invisible, but they were our guardian angels for this seminar and they ensured that everything went smoothly. And last but not least, of course, great big thank you to our partners from ICOM, uh, to our wonderful colleagues uh, who have supported us not only for this uh, webinar, but who always support us with their expertise and, and with their kindness. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to continuing this discussion in other forms, online and offline, and to visiting the Sursak Palace Museum in due time. Thank you very much again, and um, I wish uh, you a uh, good uh, year with quick vaccination and perhaps um, maybe some travel to Beirut in due time to the Sursak Palace Museum. Thank you all and goodbye.